everyone, welcome to another episode of the Jones and Four show. Today we have another killer episode for you, one that is going to blow your freaking mind. We have the man himself, Rabbit, as you might know him from one of his popular movies, but he's made so many more. He's a funny guy, he's a great person all around. Eric Stolhansky, thank you so much for being here on the Jones and Four show. Spencer, how are you, my man? I am fantastic, dude. It is so great to see you again and have you here with us today. Great seeing you too. Dude, so, so, so that I, I keep saying so. The audience knows um, how I got to know you a little bit is we both attended uh, Tony Horton's Paragon Camp. Well, let, let's scratch that. I attended it as an attendee. You were there as a speaker and then you were awesome and joined up with the rest of the activities we did. And we have some pretty cool photos of us, you know, fighting each other, boxing each other, and even running great. together. <laughs> I love that boxing. I want to take that up here and uh, at home. So so you, do that, I, you do that. You do that. You, your brother do it. You guys, you had a little more experience than I did, but we had a, a ton of fun doing it. Yeah, it was a blast. My brother-in-law um, does a lot of jujitsu and boxing and, and that type of fighting. And so when we got back from Paragon, we actually um, bought his uh, Muay Thai bag that we have and glove, bought new gloves, wraps and all that stuff. So now Katie and I are beating up each other and beating up the bag in the basement and uh, having fun ever since ever since I camp. Yeah, it's a great way to get some uh, <laughs> aggression out. Some that, and then uh, just a, a really good workout and fun. Like it's, I found us like laughing a lot, having a good time. Uh, it breaks up the monotony just to the treadmill. It's it's a blast. It's something totally different. So if you're used to the treadmill or even regular workouts, throw in some boxing in there and have some fun. And yeah, it breaks it up and it's a good time. Yeah, highly recommend. So cool. yeah, uh, that Paragon thing, uh, Tony asked me to speak, but I was as excited to like be an attendee like you guys were. I mean, I, my speaking gig was only like an hour, but then there was a three-day program. So I'm like, hey, can I just hang out and, and work out with everyone? Like, I was as excited to do the workouts with you guys and hang out as, uh, as speaking as well. Yeah, that was so cool. And I don't know how many other speakers that he had there actually did stuff. I know the ones who were there for us didn't necessarily stick around and do all the workouts. They may have stuck around for a, a dinner or lunch or something, but they didn't stick around for the whole weekend and do the workouts. So I thought it was pretty cool that you, you did that. You jumped in. It, it helped us relate to you more and just made, when, when you did speak, made it that much more relatable to us and we were able to, I don't know, just get to know each other that much more, which is great. Yeah, it was cool. Well, it's, you know, I was just downstairs on a bike. I mean, it's a, you can get yourself motivated, but like when you're with a group and everyone's like challenging each other and you see someone else doing like one extra thing, you're like, oh, I got to do it again. Right. So you're, you're going to work out harder. I don't know. I find working out in groups a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially when you're there with Tony, why not take advantage of like, you know, the master, the, the sensei, the right. Miyagi of fitness, uh, really like, you know, taking you to the next level a little bit. Yeah, getting together with the guru and letting him lead you it and, and push you. And I totally agree. The group feeling is huge. It's so much more than, than by yourself in the basement and crushing it. So how did you get to be invited with Tony? How did you get to know Tony? And we'll talk about actually about your career and, and all that stuff in a little bit. But sure. since we talked about meeting at Paragon and Tony Horton, like how, how did you get to know him? Yeah, I was just doing an interview this morning. I got through this Comic Con this weekend in uh, Minot, North Dakota, and so I was doing an interview on uh, the class of rock station promoting it. Nice. And the first thing they said was like, "Hey, and Eric Stolhansky, you might know him from P90X." <laughs> and he's like, "I'm just kidding. You probably know him from Super Troopers, but yeah, he was in P90X too." Uh, and so the background of that is, I was uh, we were doing a movie called Club Dread for Searchlight mm -hmm. Pictures, and uh, I wanted to get in shape because we were going to shoot in Mexico and a good chance of, like being in a swimsuit or shirtless or something like that. So I said, I better get to the gym if I'm going to be in shape for this movie. And uh, there was a sign at the gym that said, they're trying something new, right? It was a fly. It was just a paper flyer with those cutout things at the bottom with a phone number on it. Yep. It's, it's hard to kind of imagine how P90X is so big right now. But back then, it was, this was like 2001 or something like that. You know, and home fitness was Richard Simmons, Jane Fonda. So they would say, come try the hardest thing you'll ever try in your life, physically, emotionally, mentally. And we're trying this uh, extreme fitness home workout program. And it said, uh, if you commit to 90 days, well, first you had to be accepted. But if you, if you committed to doing it for 90 days, which you had to commit to do it and be there every day, uh, you'll get to be in this uh, test pilot. Okay. And I was like, well, that's, that could be a really great workout. It really forced me to do it. Like I said, the group's there. You have accountability. You know, you can't not show up, which is so easy to do if you're at home. 
So I, I signed up for it and, uh, you know, I was just, I just kind of threw on some sweatpants and a t-shirt and I'd kind of be in the back and I'm working out. And then uh, it was hard. I mean, it was really hard for me at the time, uh, especially like yoga, uh, leg, plyometric. And I'm sure that Tony was in the front up there looking at this kid wearing sweatpants when everyone else is probably wearing like, you know, short shorts and leggings, <laughs> always really incredibly tight clothes showing off. And I'm in there with like baggy sweats falling over. And Horton, you know, it does kind of tell me, he's like, I didn't know if you were making, man. You looked like you were struggling. <laughs> and finally, like after like 60 days, I really did start getting like stronger. You know, I've been working out before and I've been athletic, but I hadn't done like extreme old fitness. And so uh, day 60, I showed up in shorts and I just remember Horton being like, what's that? And I was like, <laughs> I, got a, I got a prosthetic leg. He's like, you tell me 60 days in this, you tell me you got a prosthetic leg. I was wondering why you're falling over all the time. And uh, I really did start getting stronger and, uh, and people didn't know. And I, I guess I just felt this confidence after doing that really good workout, um, hard workout and everything that it just kind of gave me a, a newfound strength, uh, internal strength or something. And then Horton uh, approached me and said, hey, will you be in the video for P90X? And I was like, I thought about it for a second and I said, no, nah. no, nah, I don't want to do that. And he's like, why not? And I was like, well, the reason I want to do it is because uh, I've been making movies for uh, over 10 years now. We're making our third feature length film. And if I do the video for you in shorts, people are going to identify me as the guy with the wooden leg. And people in Hollywood, they just have trouble seeing past the fact that like if they identify you as a disabled guy, all you're going to get is parts of like a guy coming back with his leg blown off or some guy in a wheelchair. Right, they're not going to just cast you as some able-bodied guy in a sitcom. For some reason, they just they just can't get past that. Right, they just want to cast you as that cliche role. Right. So I said I would rather have a long career and then say, hey guys, you know what? I just did that with a wooden leg and have people's mind uh, be blown because they can't just imagine that kind of thing. But then Horton said, well, you know, I totally I totally get it. But you know, maybe you're hiding something. Maybe you uh, are hiding this for a reason and what if you you know did the video and people who are struggling with uh, diabetes or uh, health issues and they see that you are a guy that can do these workouts with the prosthetic you know may, you might be able to help people out I said damn you Horton <laughs> just turn my theory all around on me <laughs> God, you know you're right you know maybe this is something that I don't have to hide that it could be something that uh, I can use you know as something to be proud of as a badge of honor so I said, all right, all right, Horton, I'll do your exercise video. So uh, I appeared in the Plyo video of P90X, and that was sort of the first time I kind of came out to the public about having a prosthetic leg and having a wooden leg. It wasn't something that I sort of wore because, like I mentioned, I wanted to just be more of identified as like a, just an able-bodied guy. So in the three Broken Lizard movies we had made previous to that, I never, I never wore shorts or talked about it or my character never had it. So uh, I did the P90X video, I don't know, Horton and I just set it off. You know, he did these beach workouts, and he's like, hey, you got to come down to the beach on Sunday. We start hanging out, and then he's like, yeah, Tuesday, Thursdays, we do uh, pushing and pull-ups. We do push-ups, uh, pull-up Tuesday, Thursdays. Tuesday, Thursday, kind of upper body workouts. And uh, for years and years and years, I would go to Tony's house uh, from, uh, we got to like 8.30 to 10.30, and we'd work out Tuesday, Thursdays for, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. And uh, we just became really good friends. And so he knew that, it's funny, when I first started my speaking career, because then I, then I was like, you know, sorry, I'm going on for droning. Like, this should be a two-week conversation. This, I'm just, it's kind of a long story. This is but, great. Uh, I love it. Uh, I, I, by this point, since I'd come on P90X but having a prosthetic leg, I said, well, you know, maybe I should just put a speech together and I can travel around the country and kind of tell my story about growing up on a wooden leg, wanting to be a baseball player hard to become a professional baseball player with one leg. So then I got into acting and comedy, started making movies. And then, so Horton kind of was doing a book and a speech and he and he and I started bouncing ideas together. So we were there at the inception when I started kind of creating this uh, career as a public speaker. Uh, so he'd always been there with me as a friend during this whole trial. And then when he started doing these Paragon camps, he said, hey, would you ever want to come to one of these Paragon camps and uh, share your story? And I jumped on right away. I mean, I, I, I love working out, like I said, in the group, meeting new people. I just love spending time with Tony. And uh, I just, he's such a, the real deal. You know, mm -hmm. getting you know, people say to me, is he really like that? You know, there's just so many phonies out there that are kind of snake oil salesmen. But, you know, he's a guy that eats incredibly clean. 
I uh, just, you know, every day is working out with some group. Like I said, Tuesday, Thursday is kind of a body, but Monday's plyo, Wednesday's running or yoga. You know, every day is some group and he gets a group of people, friends together. So he just runs out with great people and he's just always doing the right thing. He's just, he just walks the walk, talks, talk. That's, that's incredible. And I totally agree with you. He's not a snake oil, uh, snake oil salesman at all. Like when I met him in person and from what I heard before, he's, he's a real deal. Like no doubt in my mind. So cool. And funny, right? Like we spent three days together. How many laughs do we have? I mean, in addition to like working out, like there's a lot of funny stories and. Oh my gosh. We said he a lot of great stories. You share great stories. And it was so cool that, you know, from a paper flyer, I'm thinking about this, like how many years ago from a paper flyer where you ripped off the bottom with the phone number, called it up or whatever you did to be part of it from that to, you know, working out with fitness guru, Tony Horton for years and years and years, becoming good friends and where that has led you and how many people you inspired. You inspired me, and I'm able-bodied, whatever, and during Playa, I was cursed and swearing your name because you're, <laughs> you're doing it with a wooden leg, and I'm dying throughout this whole thing. <laughs> it's such a hard workout. I mean, I try to do it now, and I'm not in that shape. I mean, we did it for 90 days straight. Like I said, you had to commit, you had to be there, you had to eat clean, and then we did this 10-day kind of like uh, extended thing to stay in shape before we shot, so it was like, a hundred straight days of working out so like doing those jump kicks and the mary catherine's and the rock and roll uh rock stars i mean those are really those are hard yeah they are so hard but so cool and that's uh it's cool where life takes you when you accept those opportunities that you know open themselves to you and you're yeah. open to them it's amazing what can happen yeah and, and back in those days i mean when i i ripped that piece of paper off p90x wasn't anything tony was living in a one bedroom or two bedroom apartment They've been there for 20 years. I remember going to his house and doing an alley, and this, you know, he 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 wasn't the fitness guru that he is now. I mean, he was training some rock and roll stars, which he tells some great stories. But really, he was just you know living in, a, in the same apartment for 20 years. Uh, and P90X really didn't take off after it first came out, and then they started putting up before and after photographs that were real. Right. And, uh, they went through the roof. And now, I mean, you think like CrossFit and there's so many like extreme home fitness or extreme fitness places, you know, you can go to gyms or you can do it at home. Right. And it's just commonplace, but that was sort of the first of its kind. It was fun. Fun to be part of. Yeah, definitely. Great memories for you and great inspiration for other people. So let's, let's bounce back here to the talk you gave when, at Paragon. And you already talked about a little bit here about, you know, growing up to be a baseball star and having this perseverance because, okay you have a wooden leg. Like, first of all, what, how did that happen? And you, did you always have this dream of being a baseball star and like kind of walk us through this whole part of your life? Cause this is, I mean, we know you as P90X guy possibly, but you know, for Super Troopers, Beer Fest and, and your other movies, like how, like, tell us this other side of you. Sure. Happy. But first I got to take a step back and say, certainly not a star. I uh, <laughs> loved playing baseball, but I, yeah, I didn't get too far. Um, I was born without a fibula in my leg. And so for anybody that doesn't sort of know the like biology or didn't take biology class, uh, below the knee, there are two bones that connect the knee down to the foot. Uh, the front is the tibia, which is the shin bone. And the, there's a, bo a bone behind that smaller bone called the fibula. And the fibula is the growing bone. Uh, for some weird genetic reason, I was born without a fibula and, uh, my leg and the bottom half of my leg would not have grown in the same way that someone like yourself, an able-bodied person would have. And so, you know, my mom had to make a really tough decision, 26 years old. You know, I, I grew up in Minnesota, you're in Wisconsin. Like imagine just a, a nice 26 year old Midwestern woman who has a child and the doctor says, you have to make a decision. Do you want to let this child grow and try to figure out like, you know, having a shoe with a big heel or, uh, you know, brace or something, or do you want to amputate your newborn son's foot? I was actually an 18 months, so I wasn't a newborn, but I was a young, young 18 month old, year and a half. And my mom had to make this tough decision to like amputate. It's not like you're having a dialogue with a 18 month old. Right. Hey, what do you want to do? Well, I want you to make a decision. We're both involved here, right? I mean, it's like, that's a really, really hard decision to make. And I can only imagine what she had to go through at 26 years old. I mean, trying to imagine making decisions at that age. I mean, I was so immature, just drinking beer and trying to do comedy. <laughs> um, and she's like making life decisions for another human being. 
So uh, yeah, she decided to amputate my foot and thank God she did. I mean, cause I grew up uh, on a prosthetic leg. And when I tell my story, um, I'm not that old, but not long ago, technology was, I grew up on a wooden leg. I mean, I felt like I was George Washington <laughs> on a cherry tree or something, but uh, plus technology growing up, prosthetic technology growing up, my leg was made of wood. And when I would grow as a kid, as you do, you know, you get new shoes every year. Uh, for me, when I grew, they would spin off my foot, add an inch of wood to my ankle, and then spin my foot back on. And that's how I grew when they try to make me even. Wow. <laughs> so I, you know, show photographs and kind of tell that story of growing up with those wooden legs. And it was hard for us, you know, and then I just, I don't know, for some reason, I had a ton of kids in my neighborhood growing up uh, in the suburb of Minneapolis. Uh, just a ton of kids. We were always playing games. The one of the games we loved to play was you would play like a version of baseball, but you had a tennis racket and a tennis ball, and wow. they throw the tennis ball in, and you just smack it with a tennis racket, and the thing would fly, and people, kids were trying to catch it, you know. I don't know. For some reason, I just had a lot of fun growing up in the neighborhood. So then my mom uh, realized the Little League League was already going on, and she kind of just grabbed me, and she said, hey, you're going to go play baseball with the rest of these kids. And you know, I wasn't even kind of putting two to do together. I loved it, but it was just so much fun being out there. Mm -hmm. I was pretty good at it. Started putting all my energy into it. Uh, and I tell, you know, a story of like summers. I hated summers because uh, everybody, there was like, yeah, I, I tell a kickball incident story where I, I started getting older and then like liking girls and they all started laughing when they found out like my leg would fly off during a kickball game or kids would actually take it on the playground and take off my wooden leg and the boys love to go chase the girls with it. <laughs> so as I started getting older and liking girls, I started getting more and more shy because I realized that I wasn't like everybody else. So I started hiding a little bit in the summers, not one. I always wanted to wear long pants and like, you know, it's like 80, 90 degrees outside. It's hot. And so I was kind of dreading dread summer a little bit. But it also meant that I got to wear baseball pants and in baseball, hey, you get to wear these long pants and it's cool. So I was like, I started putting my energy into that and I started getting better and better and better. So by the time I was uh, in high school, Actually, was a decent baseball player and not a star, but I was the captain of my high school baseball team. Nice. And, uh, you know, strong enough that I felt when I got to college, I would give it a go. And so uh, I think that's kind of where that story leads. So I was raising a one leg, uh, loved baseball, and then I got to college. And uh, I'll leave that cliffhanger uh, with you because uh, college was Division One. College was what? I'm sorry. Uh, Division One. Division One. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, very high level of athletics. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one for sure. So, but before I even get there, like, okay, you grew up with a wooden leg, so you're used to walking with it, running with it, and and playing and all that. Were there times that it was tricky for you, or things you had to relearn with with baseball, particularly that that you had to you know work on and focus on to really persevere through that baseball dream? up to college? Yeah, it was really hard because uh, technology, like I mentioned, is much better now, which also not only means like the, the material is now carbon graphite versus wood, but uh, the technology for like the socket that you put your leg into the leg is much more advanced. You now pull on like a neoprene scuba suit. Uh, but back when I was growing up, you just threw on uh, some cotton socks. I mean, you had this like little sheath and then threw cotton socks on and just jammed in this piece of wood. Wow. And so when you ran, my skin was always just ripping off. I mean, it's kind of graphic, but like there was what you call pistoning, right? So this would happen inside my leg when I ran and, and you do that long enough and your skin just comes off. And so I just remember as a kid, like taking off my leg after I played baseball and my sock would just be bloody. I know it's kind of graphic, but um, so then I would just put ointment on, uh, put a bunch of band-aids on it, you know, pop a bunch of Tylenol. Right. And as a kid, I mean, I was a kid. Uh, you want to go out and play and do like everyone else. You want to be able to see everyone else run around. So you kind of just suck it up and your pain threshold starts to get pretty high, but it sucked. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like it hurt. Right. So yeah, sure. Uh, running uh, was not easy. Right. So I couldn't ever do cross country. You know, it wasn't like anything. Basketball wasn't the greatest, wasn't the easiest uh, football, but baseball, you know, you had a short, you kind of hit the ball and you just, usually ran to first or second, right? You know, right. if you get lucky, you had a home run, then you get to trot. But, um, you know, the, dis the running was a little bit easier. And then I played third base or first base, and you kind of just planted yourself and, you know, played goalie a little bit on the hot corner. I love that you're, you're able to persevere through that pain, and I think a lot of people struggle with that 
not and with physical disabilities but other ones do too they just they get stopped by something and then they let that stop them and or slow them down so much that they don't they decide it's not worth going on but if you have that dream you have that passion to go after it you need to persevere you need to have that grit and go through it um to push through the pain to push through whatever that next level is um to to reach your goal or you know keep chasing your passion which is huge so good for you for doing that at such a young age thanks yeah i think uh what you said grit is a really good word to describe that you know like um i say that not everybody has a prosthetic body part but everyone has a wooden leg whatever that means right like every time i get to talk talk to you afterwards talk to anyone that comes up afterwards and say yeah it's interesting you know i have a wooden leg and then they kind of tell you so everybody has their wooden leg whatever that sort of like um mental obstacle maybe what their challenges is, you know, whatever's going to cause them to have those bloody gym socks. Um, so, but can we, can we kind of raise that threshold, whatever it may be in our own lives to try to keep fighting through and have that grit, just keep on going. Yeah. And, and yeah, keep pushing through and the grit. I'm going to throw that question out to the Jones and Ford tribe, our audience members to say, what is your wooden leg? I mean, let us know, Drop it in the comments, message us, uh, message me, or take us on social media, and we'll give you all the links at the end. But let us know, what is your wooden leg? Think about it, and let us know how you persevered, if you can, or what you are going to do to help you persevere and get that grit to continue on. So, so let's shift a little bit. You're in college now. You're in a D1 school. You're, you're going after this, this baseball dream, and D1's hard, right? So let's just lay it out there. Did you make it onto the team? <laughs> At a D1 school? New. No. New. No. Uh, quick background. I went to a school called Colgate University, upstate New York, small school by Syracuse. And uh, you, know, you think a small school, it's like 2,600 kids. Yeah, what the, you know, maybe, I'll, maybe I can make a baseball team. Yeah. But we had a really good hockey team. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, in 1989, we're the, uh, we came in second place in the, in the national championships. We lost to Wisconsin, you know, what a 50,000 person school. Darn and, Wisconsin. Woohoo! <laughs> Wisconsin beat us, that's right. And uh, that just shows you the level of athletes that we had on our hockey team. I mean, most of them were recruited from Canada. They were huge, athletic, really, really, really talented. And spring came, the ice melted, and they, <laughs> they played baseball. But I showed up at baseball tryouts, and, like, all these amazing hockey players were also now on the baseball field. And so <laughs> I was like, wow, wow. It was a, it was a wake-up call. Um, it was fun playing previous to that. And then it was like, yeah, these guys are just way better athletes than me. And, 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 and it was okay. You know, it's fine. Right. I mean, it was hard at some point. Kind of there's part of me being like, this is something I had done for 15 years. I guess I started when I was like eight or nine, even playing before that. And all of a sudden like you become 18, 19 years old and it's just done. Right. It's not like there's anywhere that, where else to go. Maybe like summer rec leagues or something. Back <laughs> right. It's over. Right. I mean, everything that you love doing is just like done. Mm -hmm. It's a harsh reality, but that's life, right? And you got to sometimes say, well, sometimes you can't be six foot five and be a horse jockey. Right? It's hard. Like, you know, my friend's daughter, they grew up, said, when I grow up, I want to be a giraffe. And you're like, well, <laughs> it's a little tough. Yeah, you know, like we can't, it's unfortunate, but we can't, like, there's some people that will say, you can do anything that you set your mind to. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just not that guy. I'm not that guy, but we can pivot, we can adapt, kind of like we're doing right now during COVID, right? You know, sometimes you got to find that way when life shuts you down or says, you know, we got to find a way to keep going. So hey everyone, Spencer Jones here, and I want to cut in real quick because I want to invite you to something special, something that's going to help you grow as a person inside and out. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Jones and Four Challenge Day. We are hosting it here at our house with the Ninja Course and all that stuff on October 3rd and 4th. You will have fun in sessions. You get some physical challenges, challenge your mind. You'll create new friends and you will have so many breakthroughs. You're going to walk away a new person. If you'd like to learn more about this epic event, go to spencermjones.com and check out the challenge days. It's going to be incredible. I want to see you there. So check it out and sign up today. See you then. So how did you pivot from from baseball, chasing that dream and the passion of, of being a baseball a star and going for it? And how did you pivot into acting? Like, how did that shift happen? Were you in acting beforehand? Was that an interest or, or how did that work? 
I had a slight interest. Uh, I was not really much of an actor. I didn't grow up and go to like children's theater or do plays in Minneapolis per se. In high school, I dabbled a little bit, but it wasn't really until senior year that I kind of like tried it. And it, I actually got cast in Greece high school, high school senior year, but I was also a captain of the high school baseball team and they coincided with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the only guy in the baseball team that was doing like a musical. Wow. And you can imagine in Minnesota back at that time, the, uh, the, the ribbing that I used to get. Uh, guys, I got to take off. I got to go uh, <laughs> musical. I got to go. <laughs> right. I gotta get to. Uh, but I liked that. I liked uh, being able to do both. I thought it was fun. And uh, so I, 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 uh, I dabbled in, in a little bit. And so I took some interest when I got to college. I know like baseball is done. I could have just focused on academics, but I, I like doing things. Mm -hmm. So I kind of poked around at university theater for a while and saw that there's some cute, cute girls that were like in the university theater. So I started auditioning and it was ridiculous. I mean, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. So, you know, the director would just like, look at me next. You know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't get cast in anything. Like two years went by. Oh, so wow. I know if I would do stage lighting or, you know, I'd be the guy bat in the black and the wings, like having snow come down from the ceiling, uh, moving desks, whatever. I, I liked being in the environment. Right. I always liked movies growing up. You know, we loved all my, I, you know, I was roommates with a bunch of funny guys. Uh, Jay Chandler Sekar, uh, who ended up uh, as Thorny and Super Troopers. He and I were roommates. And, nice. and uh, a bunch of these guys that I ended up being in this comedy group, Broken Lizard with, we were kind of running around the theater. Soder, Paul Soder played Foster and Super Troopers. He, he, he was the guy that actually had the leads in the university theater productions and oh, wow. plays. And so I, I like being around that environment. These guys are funny, cool guys. So uh, even though I wasn't getting cast, I was, uh, you know, behind the stage and doing that kind of stuff. Stage crew is just as important as people on the stage. The actors and actresses couldn't make it happen without the stage crew. For sure. So then... My luck changed junior year. I finally, uh, finally got cast, but... Nice. Took a couple years. T took a couple years, but you kept going, you kept working for it, and you, you stayed with that environment because you found, oh, this is fun, I enjoy the people I'm surrounded by, and you know, it's the good vibes, I'm gonna keep doing this and keep chasing it. So you kept working at it, you persevered right through uh, rejections, yeah. and then you got accepted into the play, you got a role, and then, so like, what else happened that led you from, let's say, from acting there to, to now being a writer, producer, and actor? Like, how did that progression happen? Yeah, so I was, uh, so I was hanging around. I, I got cast like a, a student theater thing. And uh, it's interesting, the guy who cast me in the student theater production has since gone on. It's kind of fun. You see these guys over years and years and years, kind of like their careers rise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was watching uh, Bloodline and I saw his name mm -hmm. and it turned out that he was one of the writers on Bloodline. And then I was watching Succession who had uh, Brian Cox from Super Troopers in it, who played the main role. And so I started watching it because of Brian. And then I see this guy named Jonathan Glasser. And he was like, I think he's the head writer for Succession now. Wow. One of the head writers and super, supervising producer, some big role. And I was like, that's the guy. He, and he, was a, he became a friend, but he's the guy that gave me my first break in acting back at Colgate. That's and, really cool. Yeah, and Chandra Sekar and I did it. So then Chandra Sekar and I were roommates and friends, and he said, hey, I'm putting this sketch comedy group together. Uh, you should come try out for it. So then I, he cast me in the sketch comedy group back in college uh, called Charred Goose Beak, and then uh, we came, became Broken Lizard uh, a couple years later after we graduated. After we graduated college, we went to New York City, and we uh, changed our name to Broken Lizard to be separate from the sketch comedy group that we started at Colgate University, or Jay started at Colgate University. Uh, and since then, it's just been uh, all five of us were in New York City, and we were doing sketch comedy for five years in New York. And then this uh, Sundance Film Festival kind of had this huge swell, and we went and saw a bunch of these movies that were coming out of Sundance in theaters. You know, we saw Tarantino movies and uh, Richard Linklater movies and Spike Lee movies and Richard Rodriguez movies, and we're like, wow, that's really cool that you can take these small budget movies to a film festival and they show up in theaters. We we're mm -hmm. running around New York City at the time doing sketch comedy. So uh, we said, we should try it. So we, uh, we put our minds together. And we, we wrote this movie called Puddle Cruiser and we scraped together any little money we had, which was very, very little, 100,000 bucks. And we went up to Colgate University where we graduated. It was summertime and nobody was there. So they let us hesitantly shoot 
uh, <laughs> there in the summertime when nobody was there. It's funny if you're watching that, you see there's nobody in the background. This college and it's supposed to be like in session, there's nobody in the background. <laughs> um, so we shot it for what we could, script every dime, and uh, made this movie called Puddle Cruiser, and we went to Sundance with it back in 1997. And that was how we got started. That's really cool. So you, again, you stuck together with your crew, your team of people, uh, your tribe, as it were, and you stuck with it. I remember when you chatted at Paragon that that time in New York was rough because, I mean, you're almost living, you know, paycheck to paycheck, um, you know, with apartments and food and just trying to get by doing what you love to do. And then finally you saw the Sundance and they had a break to to get into that. Now, was it an instant success at Sundance with uh, your first one that you brought or, and then it launched you into success after that or how did that progression happen? Yeah, I mean, uh, paycheck to paycheck is even being kind because uh, I certainly wasn't making enough to pay my bills. I was, I started taking out, uh, I started getting another credit card to pay off another credit card. I had to open another credit card to pay off another credit card. It just, I wasn't making enough to cover sort of what the cost of living was in New York City at the time. And then, uh, so then you take off time to go shoot a movie and then you're not working and then your bills are up again and you're still paying rent, but now you're living somewhere shooting film and rehearsing and, uh, and then post-production. And uh, so I was very, so you're trying to balance that. And I was also putting myself through acting school in New York. And um, so Bill started piling up. We took Puddle Cruiser to Sundance and we got some great audience reactions, but um, you know, it was a first time film, so it was very independent and mm -hmm. it did not get picked up uh, for in theaters. We actually had an offer and we were very stupid not to take the first offer because we thought, well, maybe some more offers were coming. We were kind of waiting, waiting, and uh, we got some advice to kind of wait. And uh, that was the only offer that came. Then their offers came and they said, well, since you uh, didn't take this right away, they passed. So our first movie, Puddle Cruiser, did not go into theaters right away. So then we were back to square one. So we had done five years of sketch comedy. Uh, our first movie did not get distribution. So it would have been very easy to give up at that point. But we said, well, that was a good experience. And so we decided to keep writing. And we wrote a second script because we felt like at least we were learning what we were doing a little bit better. We kind of knew where to put the camera now. We kind of knew how to create characters. And so we had this idea of um, we had this idea for a, a comedy about highway patrol that uh, if they got really bored in these long stretch of highways, if they played games that they pulled on the speeders that they pulled over, very sort of innocent, fun games. It wasn't anything malicious, fun, innocent comedy that we were influenced by Caddyshack and Animal House. So it was that kind of feel. Uh, so we started writing it and uh, took it out to Hollywood and people liked the script, but they said, well, who's going to act in it? This is uh, we like this. And we're like, well, we are, we're a sketch comedy group, like Monty Python, Kids in the Hall. And we're like, don't let that door hit you on the ass the way out. Like nobody was <laughs> gonna make a movie with us acting in it, like directing and acting, like no studio is gonna say, hey, here's $10 million, <laughs> right? Uh, I remember, I can't remember which studio it was exactly, but you know, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon were really hot at the time, coming off Good Will Hunting, I think. And they said, hey, if you get Matt Damon or Ben Affleck to start this, we'll make your movie. You know, we could have easily pivoted at that point. Like you could have had a movie made that we wrote and it would have been uh, very tempting. And we had right. to say no, we're like, well, we want to play that part. So we then had to go back to waiting tables, New York City, mm -hmm. uh, you know? And so then we, that, because Puddle Cruiser had gone to Sundance, we found this pri private financier that said, uh, I'm willing to make it for a million dollars. I'll give you a million dollars. I'm not going to give you this big studio money, but I'll give you a million dollars. He was, he was retiring. He wanted to try to break into Hollywood. He just didn't know how. So he said, I'll give you a million dollars. I like the script. You guys can act in and direct it. So then we had to go make it. It had to be good. We had to hope to get into Sundance. Uh, fortunately, you know, thousands of thousands of applications we got selected. And it wasn't selected for the competition because we had gone to a, the Hampton Film Festival previously. But uh, it was they allowed it to be at the midnight screening. Okay. And that's kind of like when the fun movies happen. Like the year before, I think, the last time we were there, I think John Waters had Cry Baby there. So they're kind of like the more far out there films. They're not sort of seriously heavy dramas that are usually playing at Sundance. Mm -hmm. And But in our minds, we're like, wow, okay, well, we're going to be at the, Sundance, the midnight screening. Uh, it's exciting, but where people come, they'll be out drinking, having dinner, uh, doing these parties that are notorious at Sundance. Is everyone going to go see a movie at midnight? So I guess to our surprise, we were very happy because we nobody knew who we were at that moment, at that time, you know, so... And people came, a lot of people showed up and they were drinking and smoking and having a great time. So like they were rowdy and uh, the movie started and it went over really well. 
and it got picked up uh, by Fox Searchlight. And uh, nine months later, uh, we had to reshoot an ending. And then I think it's so a year and a half later it came out. So it was not, <laughs> there's no, uh, nothing about an overnight success with it. It was 10 years before we finally got our first movie uh, into theaters. That's, that's incredible. I mean, to think of that time frame, you know, most people think of overnight successes or see a person who is successful, oh, that had to be overnight. When in reality, I think almost every single person who had an overnight success, there was all those years of hard work, of perseverance and grit that got them to that point, the stuff that they don't see. Like I think about the images that gets passed around on social media, a lot of like uh, of an iceberg, right? You see the top part of it, which is the overnight success look, but there's all that stuff underneath that happened to create that. Yeah, yeah it, was, uh, it was a lot of work. Well, good for you to persevere and, and making that happen. So, well, what, and you've had other movies since then, um, Beer Fest and Slam and Salmon and, and many more movies from them. What has, what has kept your drive with the writing and acting? Like what, how is that a passion for you? What drives you to continue to do that? If you can uh, explain it, it's a, it's a tricky one. It's a tough one. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I like wake up every day and say, hey, this drive is talking to me. Tell me what to do. <laughs> um, I don't know. We had fun. You know what I mean? There was a uh, there was it was a lot of work. But at the same time, I love the idea of surrounding yourself. And we kind of talked about this in terms of the exercise world. Like when you surround yourself with a group of friends and group of people that you uh, work well with, um, you, you kind of push each other. You know, you kind of drive each other. Like when you get a good team working together and gelling, um, you're working for each other, you're working for yourself, your individual success, but you work for the team success. Um, I don't know, we kind of, I feel like we kind of drove each other to do the six films that we shot. And uh, I don't know, there's always a lot of fun of trying to write a comedy film. Like once you kind of build that audience, you're also, you're working to try to create jokes and laughs for that audience again. You really want to try to uh, make more jokes for your audience. Right. Try to keep them happy and, and laughing and enjoying it, you know, the entire time, but also pushing each other. And I love the fact that you brought up, you know, you're, you're with your team, you're with your tribe, and that's, you work together for the betterment of everyone in there right not just you it's not just all about oh it's about me I want to get to be this fame no I want our group to be successful I want you know every single person to to live their dream and to and I'll help them do it which is huge it's huge yeah yeah I mean it's like Steve Martin I think in the master class said that every everything is niche right like if you're rock and roll there's some people that don't like rock and roll right so if you if you're an opera singer, like some people like opera, some people don't like it. So like almost every art form is sort of niche. And uh, so our comedy, obviously, sometimes we're called a cult. Like we have a cult following. Hmm. Uh, so we have a, a certain niche in the comedy world. And once you realize that you have followers that like your style of comedy, you want to keep creating content for these, the fans that like your style of comedy. Exactly. Um, and it's, I know for me, at least as a business person, thinking about my Jones and Four business and, and I'm, as I'm growing that, it's been tricky to figure out what my niche is. And I think a lot of people struggle with that at first. Okay, what, what is my niche? Who do, who's my audience? Who do we you know, target? Or who, who are my people? Who, who should belong in my tribe? And so sometimes you can stumble upon it, but I think also it's intentional. I know for Jones and Four, it's had to be all right, well, who do I want to work with? Who do I want to help? And really narrow that down, but then also be open to see, all right, who's my tribe members? And now the tribe's growing and we're surrounding ourselves with people who are positive and going after it. So, so we can each help, help each other get better, right? But it's finding that niche and thinking back, not just as a business person, but as a teacher, right? Think back about the teachers you have or our audience members have had. There's some teachers that you resonated with that you, you like their style, you like how they taught, their energy, whatever. You like that and other teachers you didn't, right? That's their niche in a slightly different sense of the word. Sure. But, you know, it fits with some people, doesn't fit with others. So I think finding your tribe, finding your people in your niche is huge because those people are going to drive you to be successful in whatever you choose to do. And I would say don't get too frustrated if you don't find it right away. Like oftentimes it takes a while to build that audience. Right. 
I know our early shows in New York City, there were times when we would have like two or three people in the audience, you know, but you eventually you build it, right? It takes years, but it takes time. So I think that's the message I need to hear. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so I think that's the message I need to hear because I've yeah. talked with Katie before this call. I'm like, oh man, I like we're working on building up this our business, but it's just it's not happening fast enough for me. But I mean, remember, it takes time, and it's you know we want to help more and more people, and I just want it to be faster. But it yeah. takes time to build something. Well, you see a social media world, and you look, oh, this person has a million followers. And like, how do I get a million followers? But you know, yeah, sometimes you just got to build that up. Exactly. We keep building the audience, be authentic, be genuine, be real, and uh, those people will come. And that's what we all need to do, right? Be real, be ourselves, be our authentic selves for everyone, which is huge. Yeah. So for you and your acting and writing career coming up, all the things that you're doing, you've released a bunch of movies, got some new things coming out, I think. Are there any things in your future that you want to like to share with the Jones and Four tribe about what's coming up for you and your crew? Sure. Uh, well, you know, fortunately, Super Troopers 2 came out in 2018. That was our last project we worked on, and that was very successful. So You'll Search Life Pictures is interesting in developing Super Troopers 3. Interesting. So uh, nothing is currently coming out because uh, we're in the development process, which obviously is very time-consuming. So we are writing. We're on a second or third draft currently of Super Troopers 3, so that's taking some time to develop. And there's another script that we're also developing that we're – Sort of hoping that we might be able to get that one out more quickly because it takes a long time to write a script years. Right. So while we're writing that, we have another script that we're developing that might be closer to getting out. So uh, and this COVID thing's weird, you know, production's been shut down. Uh, it's not like it was. Um, so currently we're just doing a lot of writing. I mean, it's been really great in the sense like it's been able to force your life to slow down a little bit, like all the travel that I had. I normally go to a lot of comic cons or do speaking engagements um, all sorts of stuff and I just remember in March I had five airline flights canceled in one hour oh but, my gosh. wow! you know it allows you to kind of like just go to the cabin spend some time uh, with yourself and so um, I've been able to get some writing done it's been it's been productive again you got to kind of pivot adapt make it work right so currently in the developing stage uh, but hopefully get the projects uh, it, develop to a place where everyone's happy and then we'll go shoot when everything kind of the world opens up again. Hopefully it opens up sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll get a vaccine and just get back, get back roaring again. So if someone's interested to either learn more about you or hire you as a speaker or whatever, where can they go to find more about you, learn more about you and possibly book you for an event? Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. I hope you enjoyed it at the Paragon. That was a fun speaking engagement. You rocked it, man. It was so awesome. <laughs> Loved it. Thanks. Uh, I think the best way to get a hold of me is probably just to go to my Facebook page. I, I, social media is kind of where I'm the most active. Okay. Uh, Eric Stolhansky. It's a E R I K. Uh, maybe you'll put it up. It's my okay. name kind of tough. S T O L H A N S K E. Uh, social uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, send me a message on there, and uh, it'll get to me via my social media uh, team. And uh, yeah, that's probably the best way to do it. I have a, a Facebook, I have a, a Eric Solhansky page, but it's just been ransacked by hackers and uh, oh. I get so much spam through it that a lot of times uh, any request going through that can get filtered. Yeah, very difficult for me to get to it because I get like a thousand spams every day through it. I might wow. have just closed it, but my social media seems to be uh, the best way to get a hold of me. Perfect. Um, and folks, we will definitely throw all the links uh, in our show notes for you. So you don't even have to worry about the spelling of his name, although you should figure it out because it's pretty awesome. But uh, no, no, no. <laughs> we'll get you set up. Just go to um, our website, spencermjones.com and go to the Jones and Four show, click on this episode and we'll take you right there and you'll see all the show notes from this. We'll recap it all as a blog for you, but then there's also all the links. So you can click on the links go check him out. I strongly, highly advise you to go check out Eric. He is such an amazing guy. He's funny as heck. And, you know, book him for an event. His speech that he gave uh, for us, his presentation was phenomenal. You and your crew, wherever it is, is going to love it. And he will inspire you like he has inspired uh, me and many, many more people. Before we wrap up this conversation, buddy, yeah. we have two questions from our Jones and Four Tribe members. So, 
Uh, but we knew you were going to come on the show and it was pretty quick. So I threw it out to our Jones and Four tribe of like, hey, guess who I'm interviewing uh, in the next day or two. And um, so folks, if you want to join the Jones and Four tribe, just go on Facebook, look up Jones and Four tribe, request to join. You got to fill a couple questions. And then if you're cool enough, you could definitely join the cool tribe. But any case, first question from Rick for you, bud. What would you be doing if you were not acting? Rick, um, boy, huh? Uh, does that mean that I have a um, an unlimited amount of funds to do whatever I want? He didn't specify, so I'll let you have fun with this. Does that mean I have to go get a job at like the Seven Eleven? Um, I don't have any qualifications. It's funny since I uh, chose this career in comedy, I kind of gave up uh, starting uh, in my twenties, being able to do anything else. You know, I, I didn't get a chance to go to intern at a hospital to be a doctor or anything i uh so i <laughs> at, at this point I, I don't think i can do anything else i'm not qualified to do anything else um i think it would be fun to somehow go work like with big game nice like uh somehow go work at a uh an elephant safari or something that, like that that could be fun definitely I, I know my, my grandfather loved traveling and hunting for big game. Well, I'm not necessarily a big hunter. I love going and seeing all those things. So I could definitely see it being a blast. I certainly, uh, I like to work like a sanctuary that protects uh, big game from being hunted. I, I, I'm a, a member of, you know, I've hunt, uh, a lot of family members hunt. So I'm, I'm all for like hunting in Minnesota and stuff where you uh, eat mm -hmm. the, uh, the venison or what you hunt. But uh, I, don't, I don't like this idea of like an elephant out there, like drinking a lemonade on a hot day you know just having a, a nice bratwurst and some guy comes up out of the bushes and just kills him and then puts it in its living room i don't know to me it's like if you're not gonna eat it and it's no it's not, i don't feel like any, there's any reason to like kill an elephant or a giraffe that's just hanging out doing nothing yeah uh, I, I agree with you I, <laughs> if you're gonna hunt and kill something use it for everything it's worth and I'm, I'm glad my grandpa always did that. I mean, he kept the mounts, but all the meat and stuff like that went to the villagers or, I mean, they used every single thing. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a complicated issue over there, but I don't know, I'm just, I'm sort of anti big game hunting. I feel like it's a different generation. I know yeah. a lot of people used to do that, grandparents era. And I know some people do it now, but I don't know. Teach his own, I'm not here to preach. You're yep. saying, you know. That's cool. It's a, a different career for you outside of acting. I would All go right. work at a uh, big game sanctuary. Yeah, cool. Our Thanks. second question from Lindsay. Um, do you still do the P90X workouts? Uh, thanks for asking that question, Lindsay. I do. I, I try to mix it up. You know, like today I hopped on a bike. I might go for a jog. Some days I'll say, you know what? I do some chest and back, and I'm going to go throw on a P90X because that's going to make me do way more reps than I would if I'm just going to do it by myself. Right. So. Uh, I find the yoga really good. It's a little long. It's like an hour and a half, but uh, my gosh, that is, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, so I'll throw Ken. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, I'll, I'll mix it in with my regular workout. I don't do like, you know, every day do the same DVDs, but I throw it in to mix it up. Awesome. Yeah, yeah they're, they're great workouts to add in and mix it up for sure. Yeah, I got P90X2, like you did three. You know, it's kind of just, just take, keep, get a little variety, a little spice in there. I'll, I'll throw it in there. And just knock it that's over. awesome. I love it. And last question before we sign off, and that is, what advice would you give a person who is going after their goals, right? They have this goal, whether it's a baseball star, or acting, or whatever their goal is, what advice would you give them to help them reach it? Um, my, uh, I tell a story, I use the analogy of my wanting to go skiing as a kid, growing up on a wooden leg, uh, it snowed a lot in Minnesota, and I used to love to go skiing. And my mom knew it was going to be hard. And actually, the first time I tried it, I went out with those outriggers, right? And I just didn't, I didn't try, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I just wanted to be like all the other kids. And my mom said, all right, uh, whatever you want to do, I'm going to support it. But, you know, you're going to fall down a lot. You're going to, you're going to fall down a lot. And she said, just keep getting back up over and over and over again, man. <laughs> we were like first getting on the mountains, but blah, running into trees and rocks and falling over, you know, but I just kept getting up. The next thing you know, I made it down without hitting a tree and then I made it down. And next thing you know, I'm skiing in Colorado, you know, it just, so I just say, what I say to people is, you know, you're going to fall down a lot. And I know it sounds really simple, but make it a habit of just keep, keep getting back up over and over and over again. 
I, I love it. Simple, but great advice. You're going to fall down a lot, but always get up and keep going. Just uh, have that grit and just keep going. Dude, that's perfect. I so appreciate you being here today and sharing all of your stories and advice with me and the Jones and Four Tribe. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Spencer. It's good talking to you, my friend. Good seeing you again. Good talking with you too. And, and we need to meet up and chat one of these days here soon. We're only a state away. Let's go out for a cheeseburger and fries some point. That's right. That's for another episode. We'll talk about cheeseburgers and fries. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Hey folks, if you like this episode, well, first of all, thank you so much for watching or listening wherever you're listening to this. Please subscribe to it so you don't miss a single episode because we have some other amazing interviews and episodes coming your way. So hit subscribe and thank you so much for being here. And until next time, folks, we will catch y'all later. Hey everyone, Spencer Jones, and I'm sorry to butt in like this, but I'll keep this really short and sweet. I want to help you live your life to the max. I want to help you chase your passions to get the most out of life. And I wrote a book to help you do that. It's my latest book. It's called Chase Your Passions. It's available on Amazon, and I know it can help you change your life and help you live your life to the max. It's basically in the book, I walk you through how to create the ultimate roadmap to success. Whatever that success looks like for you, it walks you through it. Everybody has a different roadmap because everybody's dream, everybody's goal is different. So everybody's roadmap is going to be different. But this book helps you, guides you in creating your personal roadmap to success. So folks, don't delay. Get on Amazon and just look up Chase Your Passions. I put Spencer Jones in there too just to be safe so it pulls up right away. Or go to my website, spencermjones.com and get your copy of it today. And heck, get the Priorities of Practice journal with it because that companion journal, mm, that makes it that much sweeter. All right, folks, thanks for listening. I told you I keep it short and sweet. Catch you soon.